Uh, this session is about taking uh, and building on this morning's session and watching the way in which uh, Kakadu was able to evolve. So just for the, uh, for the benefit of the audience there, can we just please make sure mo mobile phones are too silent? Um, and just for your education, if you're not familiar, the conference is using a, an app with a question set embedded to give you the opportunity to uh, drill in and ask questions uh, for later on in the, in the, um, the session. So just find this particular uh, conference session in the app, open it up, and then press the button, ask a question. Uh, pretty straightforward, it'll come through there. So uh, I'd like to start by just introducing uh, Professor Dean, the uh, Director of the Defence and Security Institute of Western Australia, who retains our uh, chair of the panel this morning. Uh, Professor Dean has an extensive background in military and defence studies. He's been a Fulbright Fellow and Endeavour Research Scholar in Australia-United States Alliance Studies, as well as a non-resident fellow with the Centre for the Strategic and International Studies. He was appointed as University of Western Australia's first Chair of Defence Studies in July 2020, and the inaugural Director of the University of Western Australia's Defence and Security Institute in March of 21. He's also the Senior Fellow at the Perth USA Asia Centre and a Visiting Fellow at the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre, ANU. Uh, Peter, I invite you to uh, make some opening comments. Thanks very much. I just wanted to, I think, return. We've got a bit of a changeover of, uh, of a number of people in the audience here. So I might reiterate what I basically said at the beginning of the last panel session about the framing notes um, for today. So what we're getting basically here is a, a mix of history, international relations, with a focus on naval diplomacy. And in viewing this particular session and the way of understanding this particular area, I think it's important about talking about naval diplomacy and multilateral exercises in the context of uh, that framework. But it also, as I mentioned, in an era where from the ADF's perspective, um, part of its role is to shape in the 2020 DSU, the region, in what we know as an era of flux, change and international competition. And making this um, approach to understanding and studying multinational uh, exercises and naval diplomacy more important probably than, than any other time. And I know that's a bit of a, a bit of a cliche to say things are more important and things are, are changing more, um, more than they have in the past. But I think I take the words of, of Alan Gingell here, who's a former head of the Lowe Institute and head of O&I, and the head of, at the moment of the Australian uh, uh, International Studies Institute, where he talked about, you know, we can talk about the international order in the era um, that, of US primacy and stuff in our region, but the reality is that that era is now over. And I think given that challenges, I think we can legitimately say we're in, a, a, you know, a bit of uncharted waters here, at least for the last 70 years, um, of what's happening in the Indo-Pacific region. Those of us who are historians or trained as historians, can you know, we can bang on about things that happened further than 70 years ago, but I think for that modern context, I think that's really important. Also, the element of what role do these exercises take on in playing, seeing, uh, in playing a deterrence role? And how do we see the intersection between shaping and deterring and indeed responding, as the DSU talks about, particularly when we're talking about HADR operations, we're talking about operations at the lower end of the conflict spectrum, which many of these exercises are focused specifically around. And in, in this area, I think, of change of international competition, as well as cooperation, which are happening in parallel, that provides for an interesting frame for us to think about how exercise Kakadu has evolved and brings us back to that notion of the overall conference theme for the, these couple of days, which is how do these all relate to giving us a commonality of purpose within the region and the things that we're doing in international security, particularly as we focus on Southeast Asia. Thanks for the uh, opening comments. Uh, it's with great pleasure now I can introduce to you uh, Mr Justin Burke from the uh, University of Macquarie University. I've been uh, looking forward to this presentation this morning because he's going to be talking about Kakadu and the importance of naval diplomacy. So Justin is a non-resident fellow at the Centre for Maritime Strategy and Security Policy at Keele University and a PhD candidate in naval strategy. So um, Justin, I invite you to take the lectern and present. Thank you for the kind introduction and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. May I start by saying thank you to the Sea Power Centre Australia for the kind invitation here today. It seems simultaneously like a very long time ago that we were all together and, and also 
just a few minutes ago, Geoffrey Till speaking last time and Peter Dean also. Uh, so it's great that we can all be here together. Uh, I also must thank Sea Power Centre for their support for our research in recent years. Uh, Sean Andrews, Alistair Cooper, John Perryman. I certainly hope that John Perryman didn't elect to retire uh, from his role due to the incessant emails and, uh, and questions and queries I've peppered with him with over recent years. Uh, also, I must thank in absentia, if I may, James Goldrick, a more generous and knowledgeable mentor uh, for not only myself, but many other young navalists, or emerging navalists, let's say. Recently, many of us watched with great pride as James was awarded the Hattendorf Medal uh, with the uh, Naval War College in Rhode Island. I am sure that you join me in wishing him a swift return to good health. I also see several of my undergraduate students from Macquarie have blown off classes to be here today. So as we are inspired by the Geoffrey Tills, the James Goldricks, etc., it's nice to see that uh, we can inspire others to take a greater interest in naval affairs. I would hardly be qualified to talk about diplomacy if I didn't add that I explicitly told them they would get no additional marks for turning up today, while simultaneously indicating implicitly that it couldn't hurt. Okay, so to state the obvious, I'm a political scientist, not a historian. If it gives you any reassurance, I rest upon the words of Sir Julian Corbett. I quote, to collect and study the ascertained facts of war history and patiently build up your doctrine upon the solid foundations they afford. We take this to be our MO. In that spirit, in recent years, uh, we have been working at the behest of the Sea Power Centre with my Macquarie colleagues, Associate Professor Adam Lockyer, Dr. Eve Heng Lim, and Fred Smith, US Navy retired, to address several questions of interest, particularly naval diplomacy and particularly the Indo Pacific Endeavour activity uh, and, and receiving assistance from practitioners such as John Early in that regard as well. Uh, I also note ongoing work with Dr. Lockyer for the Australian Department of Defence, looking at the US maritime strategy of the 1980s, exercises and assertions and lessons to be learned for us in the present time. And separately mention my thesis work, uh, a master's thesis and now PhD, looking at the underappreciated story of the Collins class submarines being used in certain aspects of naval diplomacy. I mentioned also, if I may, my background uh, prior to joining the Ivory Tower, a journalist for the Australian for the best part of the last decade, uh, and simultaneously working for the Yomiuri Shimbun of Japan, the world's biggest newspaper, ladies and gentlemen, 20 million copies a day, they still publish an afternoon edition. It'll become clear why I mentioned this just a little bit later. I'm thrilled to share today the insights of some of the research we've been fortunate to do. Uh, I note the caveats that they are presented from an Australian point of view, uh, as indeed commissioned uh, for Sea Power Centre from that perspective. I am speaking in a personal academic capacity, not on behalf of any of my many and various employers, and any uh, gentle criticisms, suggestions are offered with the greatest respect and affection for those that serve uh, their professional lives uh, in dedication to their navies or defence forces. Next slide, please. I can do this. I don't appear to be doing it correctly. I feel like Chris Whitty. Next slide, please. All right. 
I shall begin nonetheless. The slides are supportive but not decisive elements to my presentation. Naval diplomacy, ladies and gentlemen, it is worth considering to begin with uh, the shoulders uh, of the greats of naval diplomacy, the literature on which we rely, the shoulders on which we stand to consider this. If nothing else, the scholarly literature of naval diplomacy has yielded some pithy quotes. John Stuart Mill, our diplomacy stands for nothing and we have not a fleet to back it. Kevin Rowlands, what navies do instead of what they train for. Rowlands again, middle-aged sailors drinking together instead of young sailors fighting one another. I suspect there'll be a bit of that going on this week. It is true to say that the field's genesis was in the height of the Cold War in the 1970s. Naturally, people have consulted the great texts of uh, naval history and strategy, looking to Corbett and Mahan for uh, mention of naval diplomacy, examples of naval diplomacy, to borrow a phrase from a rather controversial US Supreme Court decision Naval diplomacy exists in the penumbras and emanations of Corbett and Mahan. That is to say, they never explicitly use terms like that or address it, but there are familiar examples uh, discussed uh, that we would recognise, things like prestige of navies and the strategic use of that. Indeed, the Cold War era makes perfect sense for the birth of this field if you consider naval diplomacy as an apologia for naval surface fleets in an era where they had ceased to have the opportunity to demonstrate their worth by sinking each other. When class after class of ship uh, could be commissioned, used and decommissioned without firing a shot, uh, naval diplomacy was a way of explaining an ongoing strategic value. Enter former British Army soldier and diplomat Sir James Cable. Cable is very much the father of the field, publishing his work Gunboat Diplomacy in 1971 and providing a longitudinal case study of the era 1919 to 69 in the first instance and creating a typology of what gunboat diplomacy meant, limited use of naval force in, in four different uh, criteria, definitive force, purposeful force, catalytic force and expressive force. Several things are notable about Cable. He saw gunboat diplomacy as something you did to someone with a binary win-lose outcome. He was a fan of the force end of this uh, spectrum, this typology he created. Um, remarkable for someone whose career was in diplomacy. He is uh, extremely suspicious of uh, the expressive mode of gunboat diplomacy where, where force is not present. I quote, in its expressive mode, limited naval force resembles the ceremonial and representational aspects of ordinary diplomacy, equally rich in anecdotes, equally unproductive of identifiable advantages, equally dear to rom romantic schoolboys who become politicians, diplomats and naval officers. Such practices may be legitimately recorded without too nice a regard for their utility, they are inherently likely to continue. Extraordinary stuff. Also that same decade, Ken Booth uh, integrated naval diplomacy into his famous triad of naval roles. Uh, it needs no introduction and it lives on and it ran maritime doctrine as indeed in many other places across the world, proving perhaps that triangles are both the strongest shape in nature and political science. Many others during that same era offered uh, competing typologies, notably Edward Lutvak, uh, and notions such as presence uh, were advanced uh, as a core mission of the US Navy, uh, notably by Stansfield Turner. It was not limited to the West either. Admiral Gorshkov of the Soviet Union wrote uh, directly about these topics, naval diplomacy in the sea power of the state. So since then, the field has seen efforts at broadening the scope. What was gunboat uh, has become naval, and in some cases, it is argued, should be replaced by the word maritime, or the notion maritime. Uh, broadened by humble efforts such as my own to bring 
submarines uh, into the discussion, a notion that Cable vociferously disagreed with. Very recently, authors such as Geoffrey Till uh, in his Sea Power, A Guide for the 21st Century, re-emphasised forward presence as the enabler of so many other things. And also, uh, would be remiss not to note Christian Lumiere, uh, who's applied game theoretic reasoning uh, to naval diplomatic interactions and explicitly looked at paranaval diplomacy, uh, which is something of particular relevance in our region. But it was not until 2019 has someone repeated Cable's longitudinal case study and advanced a more modern typology of naval diplomacy. The Royal Navy's Captain Kevin Rowlands in his Naval Diplomacy in the 21st Century. Rowlands new model was developed by drawing on communications theories and stakeholder theories. For him, naval diplomacy is a subset of general diplomacy and a means of communication between maritime actors, both state and non-state, in pursuit of their interests. So without putting Roland's rather busy model on the screen, I won't uh, labour description uh, of how that particular model works, but that is sufficient to say it provides a map onto which uh, any and all uh, naval diplomatic activities uh, can be oriented uh, from what they are intending to communicate to whom uh, and how. So uh, I, I commend that to you. Since we are here to talk about Exercise Kakadu, uh, it, it, it bears asking what Rollins has to say particularly about exercises. So he notes that trust is a key question uh, between different states uh, with low trust. Uh, there are typical uh, kind of activities that can be practiced uh, with high trust and high capability. It goes to the other end of the scale, uh, two examples like anti-submarine warfare. Complexity and interoperability progressively increase until only the very closest of allies are capable of fully integrated operations in difficult scenarios, he writes. Noting also that the signal of trust in these exercises can often be that uh, anti-submarine warfare exercises, and I think of Ozindex, for example, an opportunity where Australia and India have conducted these exercises, it implies uh, a familiarity, a trust, an intimacy that would not exist, would not be conceivable if it were with a partner that you conceived of fighting at any time, right? So it is a high-level statement. Rollins notes also, the cancellation of exercises uh, is a signal. The disinvitation to exercises is a signal. I note also that some debate continues about whether exercises should be taken at face value as signals of authentic preparation for conflict. Um, certainly, uh, in the maritime strategy era, carrier strike groups of the US Navy uh, went uh, terribly close to the Soviet Union, sometimes to surprise them and to demonstrate uh, particular capabilities. Um, was it a bluff? Was it uh, what they intended to do in conditions of conflict? There is a minority report. There are people that dispute that, uh, chiefly amongst submariners, submariners who had the expectation that they would surge to the front uh, and an undersea battle of attrition uh, was and is always going to precede such surface actions. Reasonable people can disagree, but certainly when looking at exercises and trying to uh, compute their um, signalling uh, potential, uh, one must always allow uh, some probability of bluff. I would now like to present a key insight from the research that Dr Lockyer and I have completed for the Sea Power Centre, and it asks the question, which I think is really important, is engagement 
is interoperability, a means or an end. So for our research, we developed a dichotomy uh, of two different ways of looking at this, answering this question, one of which we call the capacity image of naval diplomacy, one of which we call the strategic image of naval diplomacy. The capacity image could be described as the default position of the ADF and the RAN, and it views naval diplomacy as being primarily concerned with providing the government with options and being able to effectively execute government orders if, when, and however they are received. The government might call upon the ADF to do any number of tasks, and so the impulse is to maintain readiness and maintain capacity as an end in and of itself. This extends to being able to operate effectively with regional navies and having interpersonal relationships that can be called upon. It is easy to imagine situations, in fact, we know of situations where the government of the day may call upon Navy to perform a task, uh, which is subsequently enabled by a phone call between an Australian Naval officer and a friend or colleague from another service. It's akin to what political scientists would describe as building social capital, inspired by Robert Putnam's work, Bowling Alone. In contrast, the strategic image views naval diplomacy as a means of shaping behaviour of other states, whether they be allies, neutrals or potential adversaries. In this strategic image, naval diplomacy should influence the decision-making of the regional decision-making elite of other nations key contribution uh, in focusing on that decision-making elite from Ross Babbage. All right, so not to repeat uh, the comprehensive uh, previous uh, description of Exercise Kakadu over the last 30 years, certainly true to say that cooperation and engagement were the initial and ongoing impulses of this exercise uh, and, a, and a proud heritage of, of achieving those goals it has, it can claim. Though it must be said, uh, the inclusion in 2018 of the PLAN frigate uh, was very telling in naval diplomacy terms. It spoke to the primacy of this big tent approach uh, to making engagement uh, the main issue um, and therefore, in theory at least, practitioners may have a different view, in theory at least, at the expense of an exercise characterised by high levels of trust, as we say, and at the expense of exercises which reflect an authenticity of how we intend to fight in conflict together. So we ask the question, is exercise kakadu an example of capacity image or strategic image Clearly, I would argue the former. Engagement is seen as an ends. This, the distinct absence of anything resembling a strategic message to regional decision-making elites, uh, we can see in the unclassified exercise instructions. You know, the public affairs plan uh, from 2016, for example, contains key messages and themes which run to 15 different iterations of cooperation and interoperability before almost flirting with the strategic message. Quote, the ADF seeks to work with regional and strategic partners to provide a stable and cooperative security environment. That, that's an ends, that is a, an objective, but uh, it could be more. The target audiences of this public affairs plan include coalition partner publics, national, regional and local media, defence personnel and their families and friends, Australian public and key stakeholders through Australian national media outlets, arguably the same thing as the second. As I've said, the capacity image is the default uh, of the ADF, it would seem. It is not to say that it's without value, but it is failing to exploit the full potential that naval diplomacy affords. So what might we say of Exercise Kakadu going forward, if I may be so bold. I'll start with a do and a don't. 
I don't. I would say it is a precondition that participating nations feature the friends and allies that we have in the region and exclude potential adversaries, specifically the PLAN. Uh, I think it would be clear after the 2020 Defence Strategic Update, and certainly if not then, then now, after the February lazing incident in the Arafura Sea, it would be strategically incoherent to repeat that invitation. And a do, a suggestion, if I may. Last year, uh, the Indo-Pacific Endeavour Task Group took the unprecedented and, I would argue, newsworthy step of appointing a uh, captain from the Philippines Navy, Captain Constancio Reyes, as the task group's deputy commander, an invitation meant to honour the milestone of 75 years of diplomatic relations between our two countries. Such was the enthusiasm for that appointment amongst other regional navies, as we understand. Many have already registered their interest to participate in that function should it be an ongoing feature. As true for Indo-Pacific Endeavour than true for Kakadu, it could be a very significant uh, message of engagement, interoperability and trust, and one that will cut through to region, regional decision-making elites, as we say. But what should such a strategic message sound like if the ones that have been uh, offered uh, thus far are uh, lacking that strategic bite? It would, um, I, I would argue again, back to our report uh, that we produced for Sea Power Centre, it is hard to do. Easy to say, but hard to do. A proper strategic message to carry forward. Um, Noting, uh, for example, the strategic message uh, our Navy has carried to the Pacific Islands in recent years ad nauseum, that we are the security partner of choice. Every marketer, every advertiser will tell you not to remind the customer that they have a choice if you don't have to. It is the kind of message you would carry uh, in commercial terms if you had an undifferentiated product for example, a budget airline. We know you have your choice of airlines and we thank you for choosing us. Australia is not a budget airline in security terms. Uh, and yet we've carried a message that reminds our friends and partners uh, that they have a choice. And indeed, as in the Solomon Islands, when a choice has been exercised, which we disagree with, um, we've reacted with consternation not to say that a different message would have been completely decisive, but words matter. Uh, and we can hardly fault people for ex exercising a choice which we have continually reminded them that they have. So what would a proper strategic message for exercise Kakadu sound like? Uh, I note the words of Chief of Navy uh, yesterday opening sea power. The words of uh, Peter this morning it would connect this notion of interoperability and cooperation, which are good things, between our Australia and its regional friends and allies to deter any revisionist states from pursuing interests hostile to a free, open and rules-based Indo-Pacific, connecting to the strategic ends. And as we've said, uh, the public affairs strategy must make getting this message to the decision-making elites of our region a priority, and they're not currently noted on the list at all. There is one more challenge to note, and that is how the ADF gets this message out. The following is said with love, and it comes from 10 years as a print journalist uh, covering all sorts of people in all sorts of situations from Oscar-winning divas, to the bereaved, to the sexually assaulted, to disgraced former senators who took donations from Chinese interests and contradicted their party's position on the South China Sea, people who had something to lose in talking to me. Yeah, so I know of which I speak, and my opinion is that defence media has become risk-averse to a self-defeating degree. I am in good company. My 
former colleague Brendan Nicholson of Australian Strategic Policy Institute made the same point to CDF in 2019. But we would encourage defence media to consider opening the aperture of cooperation a little bit wider, tolerating perhaps a little bit more risk. And it will do a lot more good than ill. Social media posts and uh, stories in the Navy news are great, but they are not going to persuade the people we need to persuade. It is at this point I'm sad that my slides aren't here for you to see because I did make a rather charming illustration of unmanned underwater and unmanned surface vehicles, repeating the words of Winston Churchill during the Altmark incident, suggest that honour is served by submitting to superior force. This is by way of pondering the future of naval diplomacy, some of the challenges and some of the opportunities. Of course, as navies change, as we move to uh, include unmanned assets in our arsenals, there are questions about how the psychological element of diplomacy, of persuasion and influence might work, uh, might work differently. As an academic discipline, as a practical discipline, uh, there are challenges, uh, certainly. There are challenges to maintaining the special naval uh, character of naval diplomacy. You know, it needs to be pointed out that an activity explicitly about naval diplomacy, like the Indo-Pacific Endeavour, can be designed uh, at jock by soldiers in the first instance. Uh, it can be led by uh, an RAAF uh, commander, as was the case with Rick Owens several years ago. Uh, it is whole of government. Uh, it is joint. Uh, and there are risks that the special heritage uh, and special character that the Navy brings to naval diplomacy might be subsumed and lost. There are risks within the academic discipline, true of many notions and topics, that by expanding and modernising the definitions and models, we may become inclusive to the point of incoherence. Uh, many regard gunboat as having been displaced by naval, as being displaced by maritime uh, diplomacy, inclusive of things like uh, Greenpeace flotillas, uh, in inclusive of non-state actors uh, and, all, so, and, and such. So that is indeed a risk. But I would underscore that I think the opportunities uh, outweigh the challenges and the opportunities demand that we continue to think, talk and write about naval diplomacy. To wit, naval diplomacy might be the key to deterring, preventing war in our Indo-Pacific region in our time. That alone is worth the price of admission. No less explaining the strategic value of what navies do during peacetime is crucial to maintaining the support of the Australian taxpayer for the considerable expense an effort of growing our fleet in the ambitious ways we've chosen to do. I'll finish my remarks there. Thank you. Uh, Justin, thank you for that. Uh, we'll work through some of those slide aspects, I think, sort of behind the scenes there, but uh, I'm confident the fact that there wasn't there did not detract from that and uh, allowed us to really focus on it. I thought it was, it was excellent. You were frank, you had some great advice and some very salient observations there. I would think, um, just from an international relations perspective, I think your students are behaving perfect hedging behaviours. Um, so that's, uh, that's, that's great to see. Uh, and I, th I just couldn't help but think about some of those immortal words of sort of President Roosevelt, where it's like, you know, talk quietly but carry a big stick. Um, and how you're trying to do it. But we shouldn't also forget that we often see naval diplomacy at work in our region. It was only a few years ago that uh, the G20 was being hosted in Brisbane and the Russians deployed a task group down here to influence that environment. Uh, I had the uh, privilege of, of being CEO Parramatta and we were the shirt front at the time uh, to go through. And I remember having a conversation with the Russian captain on the night that Putin flew out 
and he said, Australian warship, uh, this is the Russians, we have finished our climate change research, we are returning home. <laughs> so I think that's the underlying sort of uh, piece of naval humour that you can always bring to it and the character of it. But it gives me uh, great pleasure now to uh, introduce our uh, colleague from Papua New Guinea. And again, just riffing on a little piece of what Justin said about friends and colleagues, uh, we have connections. It was only about 20 minutes ago that Philip and I found out that we actually went to the same school uh, in Papua New Guinea for a, a number of years up in the Eastern Highlands, uh, a little uh, school, Ayura uh, SIL, in a, a little town of Kainansu in the Eastern Highlands. So there's connections no matter where you think they might be in the world. But uh, Philip uh, entered Papua New Guinea Defence Force Academy in 1985. His commands have included the PNG small boat team from 92 to 94. P, uh, HM PNGS Buna from 96 to 98, the Rebel from 99 to 2000, and Draga from 2001 to 2002. Ashore, he has served in roles as varied as the Executive Officer to the Patrol Boat Squadron, uh, J3 Maritime at the PNG Joint Operations Headquarters, and Commander of the PNGDF Patrol Squadron. He is a graduate of the United States Naval Staff College, the United States Joint uh, Forces Staff College, National Defence University and the United States Naval Command uh, College. After graduating in 2013, he was awarded a scholarship and remained at the Naval War College as an international fellow for further studies and a teaching fellow. His qualifications include bachelor's degrees in public policy, a master of liberal arts in international relations from the university uh, in Newport, Rhode Island, and he, currently he is pursuing a doctoral degree in international relations. So you can see why Commodore Polaro was appointed as the Deputy Chief of the Papua New Guinea Defence Force in July 2021. We invite you to present. Uh, thank you for your kind remarks. Uh, a lot of qualifications at the cost of uh, life of uh, some trees. I first attended the uh, Sea Power Center for a short strategic studies course. I believe it is still at uh, Javis Bay, or it's been moved elsewhere. And my instructor was James Goldrick. As he was taking us through, I failed to understand, uh, struggled to understand gunboat diplomacy. Because the question I had was, how can a boat with a gun try to make friends? By the way, sea power in the 21st century, the short address I have is titled Naval Diplomacy, Building Confidence and Trust. My distinguished guest, good morning all. I acknowledge and re respect the traditional landowners of this land on which this building and we are now using in the past, the present and emerging. The Papua New Guinea Defence Force Maritime Element first participated in the original Royal Australian Navy Exercise Kakadu in 1999. A regular attendance ensued in the biannual event, and over the last 20 years, Papua New Guinea's major contribution was usually two times a patrol boats in each respective exercise activity. That, however, did not limit Papua New Guinea's other levels of participation which randomly but selectively included attending the fleet commander's conference, cross-deck training, and observer training. The Papua New Guinea Defense Force maritime element strategic and operational objectives in attending exercise Kakadu included maintaining our bilateral relationship and alliance with Australia and other nations in the region. Papua New Guinea Defense Force maritime element capability platforms and personnel exposure and interoperability in complex international training exercise environment. Continuous and professional naval training for Papua New Guinea Defense Force maritime element personnel in multilateral naval exercise and to apply training objectives and outcomes in the national security context. The most relevant observance is the exercise objectives and outcomes translate into benefits such as being tangibly observed through performance improvements in our communications, 
seamanship skills and engineering departments respectively, complementing effective command and leadership at all levels. These benefits set the foundation for our future participation as Navy, our Navy endeavors to harness an era of resurgence. Hence, the short address intends to highlight the importance of Exercise Kakadu by briefly stating the greater benefits that will positively affect the Papua Indian Defense Force Maritime Element and the nation moving forward into a small blue. And that's our dream. Please don't be alarmed with that. In doing so, those benefits will be briefly stated that will drive our further aims and objectives as a consistent partaker in Exercise Kakadu. These benefits fall under training, which is essentially the underpinning benefit, influencing the Papua New Defense Force maritime element in embracing Exercise Kakadu, or we always refer to as XKA, in operational calendar activity every two years. Continuous training as a fundamental organizational requirement. Training is a core function of any organization. It, it, it maintains the continuity of organizations and sustains the performance of all manpower and asset resources. Exercise Kakadu has always a venue and training ground for the Papua New Defense Force fleet and personnel to consistently undergo naval training for the survivability of the organization. Ships, on the other hand, are key operational assets. Hence, during the exercise period, must also be put through a series of tests and trials where the systems are assessed for operational viability. Hence, maintenance routines are accurately determined for continuity and best outcomes. Personal and human resources management in every organization form a cycle. Fundamentally, the reluctant the re redundant must go, and new generation manpower must be enlisted. The gap in between is the continuous training cycle that must be maintained. The Papua New Guinea Defense Force Maritime Element has continuously benefited from Exercise Kakadu as a major training platform in developing and maintaining its manpower cycle in upscaling, gaining professional knowledge, and accumulating experience every time. Training for professional mastery, by far, Exercise Kakadu has always been the biggest exercise avenue for the Papua New Guinea Defense Force maritime element. Kakadu is complemented by Exercise Paradise, which is a domestically held exercise, also held by annually. However, Exercise Kakadu is the single biggest international level exercise in which the Papua New Guinea Defense Force maritime element is very privileged to participate in. To better explain the, this achievement, we can home in on a typical bridge management setting during a fleet work exercise evolution. This is where the effect of command and leadership is boldly displayed. The different departments must effectively coordinate throughout the evolution. Success then is a measure of the efficiency in coordination driven by effective command and leadership. An outstanding product and testimony to professional mastery in fleet work are reflected in the photo X evolutions. The station and formation of air, surface, and subsurface platforms is a sight to behold. Our small navy are usually placed ahead in the overall formations. The view is magnificent, but the skill and knowledge in a coordinated effort of forming up, dance, departing the formation is what matters. Training for economic resources protection. Papua New Guinea's maritime space is a vast area of the sea. In this time and era, the country relies on the PNG Defense Force maritime element as a lead force, taking up the role as the protector of its blue economy. The blue economy, so to speak, makes up a major component of the country's GDP. The competency levels and confidence obtained and built from Exercise Kakadu indirectly contribute to the Papua New Defense Force Maritime Elements Resource Protection Obligations. Training for Force Transformation. The Papua New Defense Force is currently experiencing a transition 
in force structure upgrade. The new force we'll see in implementation of the services concept, Navy, Army, and Air Force. The maritime element itself is also undergoing a resurgence in its operational capability. The foundation built in 1999 is a stepping stone for the significant change and transition into a blue water, a small blue water Navy. Further, the significant experience gained from Exercise Kakadu since 1999 will be employed to set up the springboard for Papua New Defense Force Maritime Elements deployment into a modernized naval force. Training for defense. The overall interest is to protect and defend national sovereign rights. The Papua New Defense Force Maritime Element Standard Operating Procedures. State the roles and responsibilities of the Papua New Defense Force Maritime Element. The overarching responsibility as the defense and security of the nation's sovereignty and territorial boundaries. 20 years of expo exposure to exercise Kakadu has been very relevant for a maritime defense force that plays a vital role in defending its country and its territorial seas. The effort to upgrade systems is a welcome move to expand and rise to fight off illegal activities, but better still to confront and counter conflict amidst the current geopolitical issues affecting the global community. To accept that is to transform our Navy into a blue water capability. Exercise Kakadu is the ideal tool to maintain and upgrade training requirements, thus constructing this transformation to see a tangible outcome by the year 2030. Our systems upgrade of the newest capability platforms through the Defence Cooperation Programme with Australia indicate a step in the right direction for further building and modernisation. Therefore, further involvement and participation in Exercise Kakadu will be maintained as it is the single biggest naval exercise for Papua New Guinea is privileged to partake in for a small nation. In conclusion, the Papua New Guinea Defence Force participation in Exercise Kakadu over the years has been worthy and resourceful. Our national defense interests are supported by this exercise and it therefore will remain relevant moving forward into the next, next era. The benefits of Exercise Kakadu are underpinned by the outcomes of training objectives and range from empowering manpower with skills and knowledge in, naval, in the naval profession, applying training for their own national interest to an extent training manpower for naval warfare. The Pacific class patrol boats composed, now sorry, the Guardian class patrol boats composed the major systems employed for an at least decades of participation in exercise Kakadu. With the current transition into the Guardian class vessels, the PNG Defense Force anticipates greater benefits and more enhanced participation with a new upgraded system. Finally, and interestingly, Papua New Guinea's participation has always been the operator of the smallest vessels for over 10 years. The size may be irrelevant, but the nature of operating the Navy matters. We must still train for war. That is why exercise Kakadu matters to Papua New Guinea. We are very grateful to countries that we build relationships with in Kakadu, apart from exercising at sea that are supporting and continue to support us, apart from Australia, uh, which is our traditional and long-standing uh, partner. New Zealand, India, Indonesia, Singapore, France, the United Kingdom, Japan, Fiji, and our Pacific Island brothers, who continue to remind us as we uh, take a new trajectory, not to forget the importance of protecting our ocean resources. Head of Australian Defence Staff, I believe he's somewhere here or is here, Colonel uh, Travis Goran, though he's an army and his team in Port Mosby have done extremely very well. Thank you, thank you, Drew. Before I part, thank you for your trust in Papua New Guinea to be part of Kakadu. We understand that we buy your trust only with honesty. Thank you very much for inviting us to be part of this.
Uh, thank you, Philip, for uh, the discussion this morning and uh, your presentations both uh, today as well as yesterday on the Chief's, uh, Chief's panel. Much appreciated. I think uh, as we go through the next uh, speaker, uh, Commodore Didong Ria Duta from uh, Indonesia. Uh, Didong is uh, the head of Maritime Studies Centre in the Navy Command and Staff College and uh, we had the pleasure of working together in the last couple of years in the Navy international um, engagement space, managing the formal relations between Indonesia and Australia. So it's another example of naval diplomacy continuing when you have the interactions. And I suppose I bring that out too because that was probably one of the last face-to-face -face interactions before the pandemic stopped and then we went online. So it's great to see uh, people back online uh, as well as in person in these conferences. So uh, Didong graduated Ducks of his Indonesian Naval Academy class in 1993 and has nearly three decades of service and has gained him extensive operational experience at sea and ashore. His postings include roles as wide ranging as commander of the first sea battle group of the first fleet command, staff officer to the Indonesian Chief of Navy and a member of the United Nations Interim Force in Lebanon. He holds a Bachelor of Engineering from the Naval Institute of Technology and a master's degree in public policy. He was appointed head of the Maritime Studies Centre in the Indonesian Navy Command and College, Staff College in January 2022. Didong, we invite you to address. Thank you very much, Commodore Andrew. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I would like to say thanks to Royal Australian Navy that uh, invite the Indonesian Navy and especially from uh, Sea Power Center that uh, my colleagues in order to uh, perform not only joint research but also the uh, sharing of knowledge according the maritime security. Ladies and uh, gentlemen, my presentation will cover of the Indonesian Navy involvement, short notation from Indonesian side and conclusion. At the first time, Indonesian Navy joined exercise Kagadu by sending an officer as observer in the year of uh, 1995. In 1999, Indonesian Navy again invited and sent one ship, Karai Nala. Uh, I want to make correction, it was mentioned Fatahila, but uh, actually Nala. At the time, I was as a communication officer on board in Karai Nala. Join Harbor Base and Sea Base. Until this time, Indonesian Navy always invited to join the exercise. As shown on the slide, as note that the Indonesian Navy has been actively participating in this uh, Kakadu multilateral exercise. The exercise matters include war fighting with anti-submarine uh, surface warfare, air defense, anti-submarine, Maritime interdiction operation, also search and rescue. Now this exercise cover a wide range of maritime tasks such as humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, evacuation operation, aid to civilian authorities, counter piracy and ambiguous operation. And this exercise also as a model for the Indonesian Navy to perform the multilateral naval exercise Komodo which is uh, we have different con concept with non-war fighting exercise. From the note above, I mentioned that Indonesian Navy analyzes. The Indonesian Navy is always committed, involved in joint exercise Kakadu through step-by-step -step start from purposeful uh, observer dispatch for observe and analyze the exercise matter, then improve involvement of ship and helicopter, and on the last two exercise, Indonesian Navy sent ships, helo, and exercise controller. Royal Australian Navy intensively invited the Indonesian Navy involvement 
This is showing that relation between Indonesian Navy and Royal Australian Navy is close enough. Beside a geographical condition, both of the navies have emotional de dependency. Royal Australian Navy widely open involvement of the Indonesian Navy in Kakadu joint exercise because Australia considers that Indonesia can hold opposing influence in the region. On the other hand, Indonesia consider that Australian influence in the region can support Indonesia position in foreign policy. Furthermore, both of the navies attempted to show existences through other countries joint exercise in the region as well as conduct joint exercise at own country. RAN organized Kakadu and Indonesian Navy organized multilateral naval exercise Komodo. Existence involvement of Indonesian Navy in joint exercise Kakadu in Australia will reciprocally improve Royal Australian Navy involvement in exercise Komodo in Indonesia. Considering exercise Kakadu carried out in the uh, North Australian Sea, so there is possibility of overlapping areas practice that enter to Indonesian territory. This is occurred in Kakadu 2016, where about the training area, it overlaps the Indonesian EAZ up to 13 nautical miles. Existences of the involvement of the Indonesian Navy in this exercise directly remind exercise controller about this problem. Moreover, Indonesian Navy can supervise an activity in order to avoid unnecessary things related to Indonesian-Australian border. Through this uh, joint exercise is going to increase the confident building measure between nations to prevent misconception. Additionally, it can maintain regionally st uh, stability. There is an economical impact with this joint exercise even through the hospitality program, especially for the local authority. Related to the exercise matters, involvement of the Indonesian Navy can give new experience, especially for the young sailors, NCO, and officers. Relation between personnel can open cultural insight and establish work networking relation that can support in the future. Conclusion, Indonesian Navy involvement at Kakadu start from 1995 and significantly improve. Through Kakadu, Indonesian Navy can maintain existence in, this, in the area and could support national interest. This exercise also impact local economy, cultural insight between personnel, and also develop interpersonal relation and networking that benefit for the future. Indonesian Navy involvement directly, directly on the field could be supervisor and take preventive step when there is something that are not in according to national and international laws. Exercise matter that contained in Kakadu could improve professionalism, experience, knowledge, and insight for all personnel, such as ship's crew, flight crews, and ex-con. It is expected could transmit to other personnel. Ladies and gentlemen, that is resume and analyze of the Indonesian Navy involvement in Kakadu joint exercise. Thank you very much. Uh, Dinong, thank you very much for your uh, presentation there this morning. I just couldn't help reflecting on it as we went through there. Again, you were talking, a lot of your themes are touching on the personal experiences and the relationships that actually happen. And, and that really just ties in very strongly with what Philip spoke about when he concluded about trust. Um, you don't develop trust between two pieces of hardware, it's between the people that are operating them and in the systems and built up over uh, a long periods of time. Uh, so with that, 
We, uh, that's the conclusion of the uh, formal presentation part. Now we'll enter into a, a question and answer uh, period. Uh, perhaps while I wait for the, uh, the panel or uh, other audience members or uh, questions online to come through, I'll throw a question to um, both Philip and uh, Dion. As we design future Kakadus, how, what is it that uh, the centrality of ASEAN or the Pacific might be able to inform us so we can design those future Kakadus to be more relevant? So I'm interested in the centrality of ASEAN and perhaps some of the themes that came out of yesterday's uh, Southwest Pacific Maritime Heads Forum. Thank you, Andrew, for your uh, question. Yeah, this is my personal op opinion, so not <laughs> represent from the Indonesian Navy. Uh, my experience, uh, actually, Kakadu is, let's say, regional focus. So in the future, I think better to perform in this uh, focus because, uh, as you say, to, to, to maintain the uh, good understanding between countries. So this is a uh, very benefit for the uh, regional countries. Oh, thank you. I mentioned that we are going through a capability replacement. Uh, when we entered uh, Kakadu, I believe uh, New Zealand, Australia, Papua New Guinea, uh, the difficulty we have is you will, uh, Papua New Guinea is a small Navy. Uh, technically, technically at sea, uh, we're like we struggle to keep up to pace. Though we can, we have the knowledge, we have the skills, we can uh, exercise with the big boys, but we don't have the platform. That is the challenge we face, and that's why with the help of Australia, Australian Navy, and the Defense Cooperation Program, we are going through uh, all this capability replacement, seeing ahead, envisioning what is ahead, the, what the future holds for us as a region. And again, it's only Papua New Guinea uh, always, you know, participating in Kakadu. Uh, we would like to see, as uh, my colleague here said, uh, it's a regional event, and uh, as a Melanesian, we feel that we are leaving out our the other small uh, Pacific Islands uh, on the periphery, and they are not part of the. I mean, we all play rugby. If there's a space, please put them in, whether <laughs> on the on, on the wings or on the back uh, back line. Uh, you, I just want to put some humor to get you all involved. Most are uh, like more policing than uh, what we are talking about here, the naval stuff, which is different from yeah. what we do mainly in the Pacific. But given the threats that is ahead, we all understand the Pacific is on the rim, rim of fire, a ring of fire. That is the danger that, uh, and the tr challenge and the threat that we live with, and we will always live with forever. The Almighty himself will have to move us away and said, get away from the ring of fire save here, then there's some guarantee. But otherwise, we will be always living with that threat and the undercurrents of power play in the Pacific. That is something concerning, I think. You mentioned earlier, uh, some of our friends now are moving the other way. That's a choice, as uh, Professor, you made. Uh, they have a choice to make, and they have made a choice to take the other course. They're going to port, we are going to starboard. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um I might throw to Chair Peter your opportunity through there um, as we've got some of the stuff coming on online. Yeah, I just might start, if it's okay, with just a few observations. For, for those of you who didn't uh, make the first panel um, this morning, Justin, Admiral Justin Jones talked about a, a quote from Ewan Graham about the cult of the sea and sailors, and, and our, our keynote speaker here brought us to advertising um, during this particular session. So. I did think that maybe cults and advertising are a bit seemingly disparate, but on another level, maybe they're actually quite well related, uh, the cult of advertising, particularly if anyone's seen a, you know, the recent uh, TV series about advertising that, w that was on. Um, I think the other interesting observation I'll start with is, is Justin in his first term, Admiral Justin Jones, talked a good history of the Kakadu exercises. And um, I think in relation to where we got in the keynote today, I, I was really struck by that notion of what happens when we move into the uncrewed and autonomous um, world. How do we do naval diplomacy? How does it evolve and how does it reshape? Because one of the things Justin honed in on in his talk was he made a lot of reference to the different iterations of Kakadu about personnel numbers. And kind of he used personnel numbers as a benchmark, I think, 
and, and the number of nations involved for a sort of the, the impact that this type of naval diplomacy has. But if we're moving to more, you know, uncrewed autonomous systems, then obviously we're going to see a fall in numbers. So we probably need to think about how some other ways do you calibrate the influence of these exercises? Do we start counting platforms and capabilities as a different proxy to, to people? And then how do we do the integration of systems? And particularly when a lot of those systems will be, um, you know, very classified and, and very highly secretive. So maybe we even need to think about a, an obtuse way of technological uh, naval diplomacy. How do you get systems more talking to each other as well as the p people who operate those systems and how do you find some synergy between that um, human and machine teaming aspect, I think, of, of naval diplomacy. I'm going to say something I think it's just on my mind that's a bit controversial that's come out of, uh, come out of this talk and that's the notion of moving from naval diplomacy to maritime diplomacy. Now, as I mentioned in the last session, I spent some time in, in the Army and I spend a lot of time still with the Army now. And I, I kind of got a little bit of a problem with this, this use of the word Navy versus Maritime. And I notice it props up in white papers about Maritime Forces, and they used to be Navy Forces, but now they're Maritime Forces. Because with my lens of sort of strategic geography on, to me, Maritime is a geographical space. It's an operating environment where a Navy is about a particular service. And when I think Maritime, I actually think joint. And I think as we start to evolve, if we're starting to talk about that move from Naval Diplomacy, I think, to Maritime Diplomacy, then it's actually about defence diplomacy in the maritime environment that's inherently joint. And I think that's an, a new interesting way to reframe this conversation, particularly as a lot of the services are, are in our region are starting to work in more joint ways and think in more, more joint ways. And I think that's a, a challenge is also um, an opportunity, but also a challenge for Navy for how does the naval component then within the maritime environment contribute to that overall joint picture and that joint you know, uh, um, engagement as well. So that's just a few sort of observations um, for me about the broader aspect of the, I suppose, what we're talking about here in that concept of naval diplomacy. Um, and to start at that sort of um, high level to talk, to, to hit just enough for a question here maybe, is, uh, is the link between naval uh, diplomacy um, and strategy. Now, I think in recent years uh, we've, we've seen a lot of talk about the role of naval diplomacy, particularly in Australia, as the emphasis has become on shaping the region, on an emphasis in previous white papers um, and stuff about regional engagement. But it always has brought up that question of how much that type of defence diplomacy can get a sort of strategic outcome. And I know as one of my uh, friends and colleagues, uh, um, John Blackson, sitting in the audience, who's argued very strongly in favour of the importance of, um, of naval diplomacy and military diplomacy and what it achieved. And of course, one of our former colleagues, Hugh White, has been on the record of pointing out, well, it doesn't really get you that much. You know, in terms of actually leading to your high-end strategic outcomes, what, what can naval diplomacy or military diplomacy really achieve? So I thought, Justin, I'll put you on the spot here as the chair um, for my first question um, to the panel is, can you talk a little bit more about from your work and what you've done about that intersection between, and, I, and you alluded to it in your paper, between um, naval diplomacy, um, these exercises, and actually leading to a, a a strategic outcome and more of a play of how we form, formulate and conceptualise strategy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I, I would say that taking it, 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 there's a number of different things to say. Certainly, um, you know, from Navy itself, uh, you expect uh, the, cap the capacity image as we've described. Um, you know, I think it was um, Peter Schwartz who kind of sent me uh, an article to, to impress upon me this point about the compositions of navies with uh, operators, with bureaucrats, and with a small number of planners. And so to get that strategic message and to be calling on uh, the operators, as it were, to, to, uh, to generate those strategic messages is unrealistic. Um, and I, I've talked a little bit about where that strategic uh, elevation needs to happen in terms of messaging, um, but I think that the you know the, the glaring uh, question, if I were to to rebut myself, is um, you know so what's the proof? Um, how do we know that such messages have an effect? Um, and it's really really difficult, as Cable uh, said himself, as I pointed out. Um, it it it's 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 well meaning, it's well founded. It makes sense to do, but we have no idea uh, the extent to which it works. 
Uh, I note that in the planning documentation for Kakadu, a uh, very typical kind of measurement uh, of effectiveness uh, of the public affairs plan is included and it essentially is netting out uh, the tone of positive and negative stories uh, comparison to the previous amount of stories. It's, it's fairly uh, anemic stuff. Um, you know, I would say people are giving considerable thought about how better to measure the impact of strategic messaging in naval diplomacy. Um, it's very, very important, but uh, I, the honest answer is uh, we just don't know. Um, I guess the, there was a question on topology, but I might go to the next question, the first question for uh, um, Didong. Can you please expand on how the relationship building enhances Indonesia's capability? Yeah, actually similar like what uh, my colleague from Malaysia says, this uh, exercise typically uh, also giving influence of the Indonesian uh, young sailor improvement of the uh, professionalism because uh, not only they receive in the class in Indonesia but uh, in the real condition that they met with any other countries, with any other friends that they can exchange the experience. For example, uh, uh, like the uh, gunnery operator, so if they face some failure in their uh, uh, gun, in this uh, chance they can ask to the other uh, friends how to maintain, how to uh, solve the problem. This is a kind of like a technical, technical thing that they uh, can get from the other friends. Thank you. Um, we'll go to uh, Philip. Uh, would Kakadu benefit from having a maintenance phase? Sorry, can you elaborate maintenance for? Uh, I guess the, the, the nature of the question, I'm going to interpret the fact that we have these harbour training phases and other aspects. But do you see value if there was a dedicated period of the exercise that was a maintenance phase, which might go to a little bit what Didong was talking about, you know, the training, gun maintenance, uh, you know, diesel maintenance, other kinds of uh, pieces. So the skill sets that would be endemic in sort of ship's husbandry or any other kind of uh, a field. Uh, we are supported by the defence corporation that we have in Australia, and every deployment overseas is uh, that is part that is part and parcel of that is part and parcel of uh, uh, our deployment or participation in Kakadu. Um, I'll go back to uh, Justin on the next question. To what extent does maritime diplomacy extend to non-traditional military forces? Uh, and I guess we see a lot of that uh, coming out of the Pacific Phillips themes on the blue economy uh, and some of the non-traditional security threats. Uh, you know, there are absolutely attempts to stretch the notions of naval diplomacy, maritime diplomacy across uh, non-traditional military uh, roles and responsibilities and challenges, certainly. Um, I think one of the... Um, one of the strong examples of the way in which Indo-Pacific Endeavour carries out uh, HADR uh, activities and training at different places in the Pacific Islands and Southeast Asia, um, it, it, it absolutely falls under that remit, yeah. So if we extend that question, uh, perhaps Peter, you might uh, see this one. The use of other non-traditional, uh, I guess under your maritime concept, using of uh, military or uh, sort of para military fishing fleets and other kind of things to achieve a naval diplomacy effect or a maritime diplomacy effect? Yeah, I'll, I'll look, I think we're, we're seeing the extension and uh, I know there's, I think, either today or tomorrow in the, in the other part of the Sea Power Conference, uh, a particular discussion around grey zone activities. And I think as we've seen a, a, a re-rise in the use of other maritime uh, assets in the use of achieving a sort of, I suppose, naval effects and naval ends. Um, that takes on an important role. We've seen the, the use of fishing craft, of coast guard vessels, and often that in a deliberate attempt to stay within, below the threshold of sort of 
of conflict. And of course, as we know, sending a, a frigate or a destroyer um, has a particular impact. But if you can achieve a, a similar type of outcome, like a, a form of a, a, a temporal semi-blockade around a particular small island feature, the denial of the use of a space to commercial fishing vessels through the use of other you know, fishing vessels or research vessels or whatever, um, that brings uh, you know, this type of, I think, multilateral exercises into the zone of, of, of having an impact in some way around that. And I think that needs to, in what we spoke about in the last session, talks about the way that when we construct these exercises, how we think in the future about how we build the scenarios around them. And I think if we, we, we take some of that lived operational experience from other parts of, of the Indo-Pacific region and then start applying those and start putting those dilemmas to, um, to the different navies that are involved and the different components of the, those fleets are important because it's something that can broadly affect all of us, whether it's in the blue economy and, and whether it's illegal fishing that's happening, you know, in um, and around Papua New Guinea, or further up into the use of sort of those fleets um, and coast guard vessels to deny fishing opportunities, say, to Indonesian fishermen, you know, in the South China Sea. Th there's a relevancy for so many of the nations in ASEAN around that. So I think as long as you can, we could construct scenarios that are neutral enough that, to not, you know, highlight any particular country's issues, but are relative to all. I think that can be an interesting way and space to think about how we evolve then the techniques and the tactics that we use and the procedures that we have in these exercises to combat some of those um, non-traditional approaches which are becoming more and more prevalent. And, you know, if you believe the analysts who really focus on this, this is uh, uh, something that's not going away anytime soon. This is something that's going to be with us for a very long period of time. Um, I might mesh together a couple of the next questions into a theme to the panel there. Um, picking up on Justin's point about needing to elevate the nature of the discussion, the messaging and things, that means you've got to expand the participants, um, not just by the nations, but actually who from a nation turns up for it. So perhaps we start with Indonesia PNG first and then finish with, with Justin. Where do you see the scope for other non-naval aspects of your nations to participate in Kakadu, be they your foreign affairs or, or other elements, maritime police forces or anything, uh, to be able to contribute towards and make a more effective Kakadu that is able to respond for HADR through to war fighting needs? Yeah, for, for my opinion, I think very important and very interesting to, uh, let's say, develop uh, not only new experience, as a professor said, uh, the, uh, how to develop the scenario with the uh, 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 involvement of, from the academic perspective, I mean the uh, civilian. This is also uh, because our, our threat in the future are so, also very fast uh, changing that we need uh, from the academic perspective and uh, to develop the uh, scenario. This is very, very important, I think. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. I, something that we have to understand is this, is this is one aspect of national instruments of national power. We are talking about a need of it here. Mm -hmm. uh, from our experience, Papua New Guinea is we have to listen to the civilians. Then the military always do it this way, do it that way, this is what to do. We listen to them and we understand what they want, where they come in. I am leading a team trying to address that one back in Papua New Guinea. Uh, the civil military plan. It's always the military, like in Papua New Guinea, we are creating the lift to take the foreign affairs, other security agencies, uh, two weeks ago, uh, we always have a social and economic sector. The government came to realize after 46 years, now we have a security sector. We have to, as military, as naval, we have to also educate our civilian counterparts. This is how it is to manage a country and run a country. And then we too have to listen to them, the way they do business. And the uh, terms are used in APEC, which your colonel of the head of Australian Defence Staff asked if you could borrow it and I said, oh, it's free, please take it. We must create the PowerPoint where they will come and easily plug in when they bring their power code. 
I, with this, I fully am aware and understand. Uh, there's uh, some are following the U.S. system. Those of us uh, following the British system. These are the two things that sometimes that we disagree on when it comes to you know big events like a kind of the doctrines and the way we do our business. We have to listen. Thank you. Justin, are you any comments? I guess I'd say that I think the 30 years mark of Kakadu is significant. I don't think that if you polled 100 people in the street around Australia that you would find more than two or three that had heard of it, sadly. Uh, what, what I would do is have the Defence Minister or have the Prime Minister uh, attend Darwin for the launch of the next Kakadu and make a statement, uh, a strategic statement and a statement appropriate to the, the long-standing and important work that's been done here. Uh, and I would repeat the suggestion that elevating uh, our friends and partners into key positions within Kakadu, not just as participants, but in positions of command where appropriate, um, is a significant single signal. I think both of those things are uh, fitting. Uh, both of those things would achieve a cut through that otherwise may not occur. Thank you. Uh, Peter, as Chair, you got any comments or do you want to take it in a different direction? Yeah, I'll just add a comment and then maybe um, I'll get some questions to the panel. Um, I think Justin made the, the response to a question I asked this morning about balancing Australia's relationship with the United States with that of Asia Pacific countries about, is about walking and chewing chewing gum at the same time. And I think one of the interesting things to, to go to Justin's point about the publicity, you know, what's capturing the imagination. And of course, we're in a position at the moment of our federal election campaign. Um, you know, I won't reveal how old I am, but you can probably all see the gray hair from here. So I've been around for a little while. And, I, and I'm, a, I'm a political junkie, I admit it. I grew up in a political household. You know, I, I study politics and international relations and I follow it closely. And I'm, I'm very also keen on, you know, the domestic interactions of international policy. And I cannot remember an election campaign uh, where sort of regional foreign policy issues have taken such prominence. Um, you know, of course, the Iraq war, which is very controversial, took on a bit of prominence in the early 2000s, but never seemed to cost the Howard government any really electoral vote, so to speak. And the issue of the Solomon Islands and, and our relationship with Solomon Islands and their signing of, of a security cooperation treaty with, with China has become really prominent in the last few weeks. The thing that worries me about that is that's getting a lot of publicity, it's getting a lot of focus, it's driving a lot of the political discussion. But on the other side, what we see the focus here on Exercise Kakadu is particularly focused on Southeast Asian nations. And for Australia, our strategic policy has always been built around two fundamental key sub-regions of interest, the South Pacific and Southeast Asia. And I think what we need to do by, by doing what Justin recommends is is getting that more whole of the government approach to some of this type of stuff, reinforcing um, those approaches and getting that type of political buy-in um, uh, at, at opening of ceremonies and perhaps coordinating that with some, you know, even other political gatherings and political leaders meetings that on maritime issues that signify that to bring that home. Because Southeast Asia is a key and critical port, important region for Australia, just as the South Pacific is. And we really need as a nation, and I'm not saying that the military or the Navy, that as a nation, with our, with our public discourse on this, we need to walk and chew chewing gum at the same time. We need to be able to talk about the importance of the South Pacific, um, you know, being part of that South Pacific family, but also being, you know, the first dialogue partner to ASEAN, being an absolutely key, key and critical partner to ASEAN, both diplomatically, militarily, but particularly economically. I mean, you know, this... I can't remember the statistics off my head of how many hundreds of millions of people are in Southeast Asia, but the size of the Southeast Asian economies, their proximity to Australia is key. So I think that's, that's linking, as we were, back to the questions about um, naval diplomacy and strategy. I think that's really key as well. And it's about that national discourse that we're having. I'm, I'm actually really happy that we're having a bit of international policy in a domestic political campaign. Um, I actually think that's a good thing. I'm not a, I'm not a firm believer in that everything has to be bipartisan. If there's a contest of ideas, that's um, great. I'd really like that level of, of knowledge that we're having about what's happening in the South Pacific now also replicated on, across our nation by engagement with Southeast Asia just as much because they're the they're two key synergies um, for what's happening there. But if I can just ask a question of the panel to pivot away, I think, from that strategy stuff for a second, back to 
some of the practicalities of operating, and, and I'm, I'm going to direct this to, to you, Didong, because one of the things I noticed you mentioned in your talk is that you were the communications officer yes. in, in your ship back in 1995. And... 1999, sorry. And after the, the second Kakadu exercise, I, I read in, in a Navy um, pam account of that exercise, and it said, I quote, that exercise Kakadu 2 exploded the myth of the supposed language barrier to be able to achieve interoperability of a high order. And I suppose I wonder if you could reflect on your experience about uh, how communications worked at that very tactical level between your vessel and those of many different nations around the region with many different languages, and how you guys worked around the kind of, you know, multi-language environment that, uh, that the Kakadu exercises is, and then how you did sort of, I suppose, that broader communication between ships and as the comms officer, you know, how, how busy were you in that role and, and how much was it different, say, to your standard role that you would do on a, on a normal deployment with your Navy? I have limitation to sleep at that time. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Not only busy for for maintaining the uh, my 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 member my crew to perform the English languages, because as you know, not too much uh, Indonesian uh, sailor they can uh, speak in English fluently. Uh, so that's why I always stay in the bridge and in the uh, CIC in order to, I don't want to miss all the uh, messages that I, <laughs> I have to receive and I, I give to CO in order to, to avoid the make a uh, mistake during the uh, uh, exercises. At the time, the uh, commanding officer now become as a professor, Professor Marstio. And uh, I was successful about that. Thank you. If you indulge me just one more, just one more for, for Philip. You talked about very much how critical this exercise is for your country. Um, if from a, and I asked for a personal perspective here, not, a, not an official perspective, uh, is there one thing that you could that you think as you journey to this 2030 higher capability blue ocean component of your navy in the next iteration of Kakadu is there is there something that you think um, that could be added to the exercise that would really help your navy and help you on that journey is there anything you think you could identify definitely but we will just uh, restrict to uh, what we have to discuss here uh, yeah naval warfare uh, the higher end but we are very, very mindful. That's why to have all this, we have to replace the platforms, the current platforms we have. Uh, say to go to a mini destroyer or to a covet. There are certain things that we have to have first before we approach that level, approach that phase. So that is what we are working through. We have a very, very intensive uh, training program with the Royal Australian Navy started back in uh, 2019, uh, whether it's a uh, uh, there's some things that we have to have, like engineering. You don't get, get a qualified engineer overnight or within uh, weeks or months. It takes years. Uh, marine engineering, it takes years. Uh, the specialist skills, it takes years. So that's what we are working towards. To. We would like to see, uh, that's what we request for, I mean, Australia and Singapore, India, uh, high end of naval warfare. Uh, this is something, but we are very, very mindful of uh, like our partners that are involved in Kakadu, we cannot be, we don't want to be selfish, if I can put it this way. Okay. Thank you. Uh, could we please thank the panel for today, uh, for the, uh, the full uh, presentations and the uh, rich question and answer period. Uh, we welcome, we're going to take a break now for an hour and uh, welcome back the uh, online and the physical audience at one o'clock for the next session, uh, where we'll start to look a little bit further afield with presentations from uh, Canada, India, France, uh, and Fiji, as well as some uh, academic experts. So thank you. <laughs>